So I want to talk about what artists get up to. As I said, the gesture of friendship. In Genesis 11, we're introduced to Abraham. And in the following chapter, one of the most extraordinary stories in the history of man begins with a proposition, a calling. And few of us will be called upon in the way that Abraham was. A precious few of us will live uh, the sort of life that he did of such importance. But most of us, perhaps all of us, feel some sense of calling, I think. A sense of vocation. A calling to accomplish something with what time and treasure we're given. And most of us, if we're asked what our vocation is, will reply with a description of what we do for a living, our career. And most careers have some kind of structure superimposed on them with fairly clear parameters, like medical school, internship, practice, and so on, into which aspiring people can fit themselves and pursue their vocations. But this isn't true for artists in many cases. I think in most cases, you know, I can remember Catherine scribbling when she was very little. The, her artistic vocation was very evident very early, and I think that's true of a lot of us. But in the institutions for artistic training, consistent, coherent philosophies of theory and practice are few and far between right now, as are the parameters and guidelines towards success in later life. So for the artist, the way forward and the goals of his vocation are unclear. And Abraham's question, how shall I know, comes to mind. The artist has to proceed forth and make it up as he goes. And so the shape and character of his career are a lot like his most ambitious uh, creative endeavor. Um, like Abraham, the sense of calling seems certain, but the future is less so. And so the history of art is littered with people toiling away in obscurity and um, poverty, pursuing their vision alone. So what motivates people to forsake the clear established pathways to material well-being and pursue this murky vocation how do they go about answering their calling, and what can they hope to gain from their work? To answer these questions, I think we might imagine a few days in the life of a landscape painter, with his setting out to paint, uh, beginning with his setting out to paint, and see what he does, and what may come of it. So, the artist calling has many aspects. And perhaps the first among them is his calling to see. And this is a lot less straightforward than it seems. As seeing, I've noticed, is not something that people fully possess at birth. It's something we learn as we go. And you can see children doing this when they are exploring their world. They're crawling around. Um, the child finds an apple and picks it up and feels the texture of it and the weight of it how firm it is and bangs it on the ground and then tastes it and um, <clears throat> they're matching their sense of sight with what they can feel and taste and hear I think is what's going on there and smell so the thing's red and it's round and it's firm and it's hard or, but not hard um, it tastes good and, and mother lets me eat it, so it's food. And so now, when the child sees an apple, they know at a glance what it is, um, the weight and consistency and taste of it, and you don't need to investigate it anymore after that. So in the same way, I think we move through each day um, glancing at objects and identifying them very quickly, thousands of familiar objects as we go. Navigating by sight is what I call this. So that we can seize upon those things that are most important to us and just disregard everything else. Um, but navigation by sight 
is um, it's, it's necessary to accomplish things to move through life. You can't evaluate each and everything as if you've seen it for the first time. But it's a hindrance to the artist, to the sort of heightened perception the artist needs to do his work. So the identification of an apple is a very different thing from the recognition of its individual character. So the painter will need to capture things, uh, the things of that apple that separate it from all the other apples. The particular beauty of it, and its color and its form, and then capture all of that on a canvas. So in this way, I think the acquired habit that we have of navigation by sight, just getting around with our eyes, is at odds with the artist's vocation to see. I've gone too far. I should have put more slides in there. Well, that's right. <laughs> so once our artist has set out to paint, part of the challenge for the landscape painter is to slow down to take time and to look and apprehend the beauty of a place. So he has to override his natural instinct to glance at the thing and recognize it and then move on. And instead, look long and, and, and take the objects before him in, opening himself to the beauty and character of them. So he walks out into a field uh, in some place and looks for the right thing that he might want to paint and um, a perspective from which to look at it, you know, lining up things so that they look right. And then he settles down. Um, and once he's settled on the subject of a painting, he decides what's to be included in the frame of the canvas, excluding everything else, and sets to work. So this is where the difficult work of perception comes in and discernment. How do the various parts of his chosen scene fit together. Which of these parts should be given precedence and which parts should recede? Is there tension or harmony between the subjects or the parts? Is there vibrancy or subtlety of color or both? How, do the, how does the light fall across the, the parts of the scene? All of these things must be recognized with what powers or perception that we can muster. And <clears throat> so that we can both render the parts as we wish to do as a whole, and then make the painting fit together in, in a harmonious whole. <clears throat> and so this practice, I think, is the antithesis of our usual hurried mode of seeing. We're in a hurry all the time. We're just rushing past thousands of images on the highways as we speed down the road, and online, the images are just swimming past us hundreds at a minute. <clears throat> this is a way of looking that takes time and patience and intense concentration. And these things are by necessity absent from the habit of navigation by sight. So rather than simply identifying what he's looking at, he's opened himself to a greater kind of perception. And that's the recognition of beauty. So by choosing the spot he has and settling down to paint, placing himself in the presence of beauty and working for those hours, our artist has, in a sense, made himself a part of the place. And making yourself a part of a place in this way is not unlike choosing a home. You know, we set our affections on it and we dwell there for a time. So. Our artist comes to feel a sense of familiarity with the place he inhabits and comes to feel that he belongs there. So this is a very interesting thing to me. It's a kind of alchemy almost in which uh, something new comes into the life of the artist and that's a sense of belonging. So he's taken in the scene and he's changed by the act of opening himself to the experience in addition Having placed himself there, he's become part of the place and has changed it by its presence. 
So what our painter does then is enter into this relational phenomenon with the place that he's chosen in which each one is changed by the other's presence. So in his search for beauty, he's found a home of sorts and he's become part of that home. So this phenomenon, like, so interesting to me, belonging that's born of presence, of perception, and the recognition of beauty, I think is almost as important as the painting itself. So it's a kind of healing, I think, in which the gulf of alienation that opened up all those years ago in our ancient home it, are narrowed. So in a small way, it satisfies our longing for a secure home in which we belong. So the painter's work, the, the picture that he makes, becomes an artifact of the sense of belonging, which might be recognized by someone else. So, this phenomenon of recognition and belonging, I think, is enough to sustain a lot of painters. They just work on their own and pile up huge stores of paintings that nobody sees. Um, but I think there's an, another facet to his vocation, which is often overlooked or dismissed as mere commercialism, and that's the exhibition of our work. So while even the vagabond painter who doesn't care about money, you know, with his shabby clothes, do I have a picture of the vagabond? There he is. Um, in his messy palette, has to eat, I think. There's also a gesture involved in showing his work that transcends the exchange of goods for funds. And that, I think, is what a lot of us have been driving at this morning. It's very interesting how this theme has sort of arisen organically. So in ex exhibiting the vision of beauty that he has, the artist reaches out to those around him with this gesture of friendship. It's an invitation to approach the little painted scene that he's made and to view it from his perspective. And there it is. And to kind of step into the artist's shoes and see what he's seen and see the world a little bit as he's seen it. So this is a gesture of, of hope and courage um, as well, you know, uh, the artist is saying, look, I'm inviting you to stand where I've stood and to see what I've seen in the hope that you will see some of the beauty shining through what I've made. <clears throat> Exhibitions can be very nerve-wracking in this way. So if we accept the invitation, we enter into a shared um, recognition in that moment of beauty. Um, the phenomenon of belonging that our artist's experience in that place becomes our shared experience and something new comes into the world. And it's the sense shared by the viewer and the artist of being known. So I think this is the phenomenon that transcends the merely transactional in these exhibitions of art. So beauty, the desire for it and the recognition of it and the rendering of it and the sharing of it has brought both the painter and the viewer together in a new shared moment of harmony. The risk, of course, is that people will reject it. You know, they won't come to the exhibition or they'll mock the work or something like that. Um, we've seen that before. But you screw up your courage and you put your work in front of people in hope. So if the gesture's answered in kind, I think an extraordinary connection can be made between the artist, the place, or the object, and the viewer. And it, it is a phenomenon of belonging and being known in the world that we live in now, which is just marked with alienation and, and brokenness. And so <clears throat> that's a narrowing of that gulf of alienation that has opened up between all of us. Uh, that's referred to in those early chapters of Genesis. So here, some small measure, I think, of abundant, harmonious life are redeemed, and a small part of the world is beautified. So, in conclusion, I think 
what restores to us even partially that which was lost when we left the garden must surely bring us joy. And in some small way, we see a shadow of that ancient home in the beauty we behold. And placing ourselves in the presence of it, we find some consolation in our loss. So in the same way, we might regain some small part of what was lost to us when we form these bonds of friendship through the beauty of creation and expression. And I think this is perhaps the most important reason that people trouble themselves with art and artistic endeavors. Um, it's out of a sense of loss and a desire to redeem our home of abundant, harmonious life and joy comes from these connections to place and persons. And that's a joy that harkens back to our beginning in that ancient garden and looks forward to the promised home, free of those things that goad us to long for something more. So looking back at Abraham's story, we see the themes of his life. Um, and I love Abraham's story. It's such a great story calling and obedience, proceeding forth in uncertainty, the seen and the unseen, trust and brinksmanship, sorrow, and the joyful laughter of abundant life. And I think probably some of those who knew him thought he was a fool for leaving everything that was secure and familiar to him to set out for some unknown land. But in his willingness to set out in hope, we have this story of great faith and beauty. So Abraham's willingness to set out in faith brought him not only a son, but also something in which we all hope. The promise of a beautiful home of stability, harmony, and abundant life. So artists get up to all kinds of mischief on the way. Um, but his calling, or our calling, is not altogether unlike Abraham's. And it's a call to leave the familiar paths and venture out into the perilous world. To see, to know, to be known, and finally to belong. So it's an uncertain venture. And uh, I think one that many people regard as foolish. Um, Many of us have answered that call. It's sometimes a venture that ends in apparent failure. But uh, we go and we do as uh, we are called. And we have this extraordinary, beautiful testimony of artistic expression across the millennia as evidence of this great hope of humanity. So it's a calling to reach out to one another and to join not only our hearts, our efforts, but our hearts, and this great sojourn through a broken yet mysteriously beautiful world to our everlasting home. And while we go, anticipating this home just over the horizon, we might have the joy of belonging and being known in the beauty of each other's friendship. So I'll leave it there and open it up for questions. Dwight, where did Dwight go? There he is. Any question or comment that you would like to make? Is this from a film? Yes. <laughs> okay, it's Mr. <laughs> Turner. What's the oh, really? Mr. Turner. About Stephen Turner? About the painter. Um, uh, I can't remember his first name now because it's a terrible one. He's, he's the 18th century English uh, landscape painter who, William Turner. It's a beautiful film. So um, this and the previous image that I used, these are both uh, movies about artists. This is Renoir, which is not, neither one of these movies is family viewing, by the way. But um, I have to tell people that because I recommend a movie and they're like, unpack it in front of their kids. It's got naked in it, that's why. But it's both this one and Mr. Turner are very interesting, honest portrayals of artists and how they work. 
Usually when you see an artist in your movie, you know, it's very cliched. These guys did a beautiful job with this. So this is, I think a Renoir actually made this movie about the painter. And um, Mr. Turner is made by Mike Lee, who's a very, very skilled British filmmaker. So yeah, movies. There they are, they're a big exhibition. And he's enjoying his friend's company. Anything else? Got time for another question or comment? I think that Abraham's story is so compelling to me because he really is sort of out there on his own, wondering how he's going to work all this out. It, it, it looks to me like how I feel very often. So if you look at the way God reaches out to Abraham in the story, he gives him a little bit of information at a time over the course of about 30 years. And you can see him and Sarah and those trying to work out, all right, so what are we doing here and how is this all gonna happen? And, um, and he's traveling and, and just looking for a kind of, how do I fit into this? What do I do? What do I not do? And so that to me feels a lot like the, the artistic endeavor. You're just sort of out there figuring out, how do I fit in with the rest of the world? I mean, where's my place in all of this? Even with a more traditional artist like myself, it's difficult to find a, a spot where you feel like you fit in. And um, people very often just don't know what to do with you. You're sort of a, a, a square peg. Anybody else here have that feeling? <laughs> like sculpture? No, the assemblage in the variety of forms and sizes. The hanging plank thing? It's just stuff like that? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So difficult. Yes? Um, would you say that? Failing to pursue your artistic calling um, and failing to share the way that you see the world leads to sort of the opposite of redemption, leads you to feel isolated because you're not bringing people into that. I don't know if I would call it failure. I, I, I think that... I think that for some people, just to make stuff and, and interact with materials, even if they do it very privately, has a redemptive quality to it. So in, in life, especially where we are right now in our society, everyone's very informationally oriented. Everything's information. Online is an excellent example of just information. And you might look at pretty things online or whatever, but you're just looking at data compared to the sort of experience that you can have when you put your hands on things and, and manipulate them. So if that's just working in the garden or building a table or even working on your car or something like that, any of those things is going to be better than being a sort of passive consumer of information. Uh, so like I said, our, our painter can be sustained just by making pretty stuff and being, it makes him feel alive. But sharing things with people, that courageous next step opens up your possibilities uh, exponentially. You know? So I'm way outside my wheelhouse standing up here in front of everybody like this. But I feel like if I didn't get up here and say this today, I would feel terrible <laughs> because th this matters to me. And I think it's, it's what a lot of people miss I think artists really need to get out there and engage. And part of what we need to do as artists is help, particularly in churches, people interact with us in constructive ways. Because most churches aren't like St. Andrews where they have somebody here who knows how to do this. Uh, and so if you take a painting, like one of those historical paintings that I've done, a biblical subject and take it to a church and say, I'll give it to you 
if you'll raise money for something. They don't know what to do with it. It's not that they don't want it. It's not that they don't care. They do care, but there's new mechanism in place. And so this reaching out, I think, has to be part of, um, of what we do, particularly in just building relationships of trust between people. When I did the St. Philip's painting, there was some deep distrust over there because they'd been treated badly by artists. And to be honest, in, in a lot of modern art, there is a hostility there to ordinary people. And uh, they feel it. And so artists are viewed with suspicion now, unlike in Paris where people were, I mean, Renoir could afford to live the life he did because people loved his work and they bought it. Now we're dealing in a post-painting world where cinema, which is on the decline, is the new form of visual art where people discuss ideas and, and see who they are. So with cinema sort of tanking the way it is, I think painters like us, and sculptors and people who do dance, music, all of it, where you can interact with a person, a real person, have an opportunity. Like Tim understands this very well because he's got such a direct contact with the people that uh, come to, to listen to him. Uh, this, this, this is a golden opportunity for us. And if we proceed forth in friendship with people, I think they'll respond. Anybody else? <laughs> Final <laughs> question slash comment. <laughs> no, I kind of, I don't, I, I want to ask this question, but I don't want to ask this question. So the comment that Lee made about yeah. beauty, yeah. and I, I just, wanted to ask if you could comment on that comment um, yeah. and and if there was anything that you've experienced I mean even with just what you've described at St. Philip because I mean I I mean my comment would be you know in music it's very ephemeral you create something it's there and then it's gone and if you weren't there you didn't experience it and you you can't appreciate it you, you know you can talk about oh I had this great moment when I was um where visual art is kind of a permanent thing, mm -hmm. you know? And so are people afraid of that? Is it, is it, you know, I don't know if that goes into this beauty thing, but anyway, I just wondered if you could comment on what her comment was. Well, I think the sort of visual art that I do is so old hat, you know? In the movies, I've supplanted um, artists. I don't want people to take this the wrong way. But I feel like in the 1920s, the artists sort of gave the world a rude gesture. And you saw a lot of that going on in the first half of the 20th century. And so people just went to the movies and started watching TV. They were like, fine, if you don't like us, you know, we'll just go elsewhere. So what's interesting about that is that the movies have done the same thing. They are in the process of the rude gesture right now. What I've noticed about Traditional beauty, uh, the kind that you're talking about, I think, is that people do still want it, they just don't know what to do with it. So St. Philip's painting and a, a classical building that I took part in, a, a piece of architecture, were both sort of like experiments to me to see if people would respond positively to these things, and they did. They just almost don't think it's possible anymore. So you, you look at some of these old paintings and people think they're magic, um, that such things aren't possible anymore. Not my painting, obviously, but uh, where's the painting? There it is. So people look at things like this and they think you almost have to be from another era or some kind of rare specimen of human being to do it. It's not true. Um, so, uh, People do respond positively to it if you can just steal yourself and put yourself out there. Um, with the painting, it was really mostly just me and some people who were game for it in a particular place. With the building, I had to fight the building industry itself to get the thing done. 
So there's a structure that's built up around modernism and particularly sort of the minimalist kind of modernism because it, 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 in architecture it's just cheaper and it's the way the industry is aligned. So there are all kinds of challenges, but people responded positively to the building. Um, people want it, but we have to really work hard at this point if we want to get people acclimated to it. And that's the gesture that I'm talking about. Like, hey, y'all, <laughs> this is possible. And the painting found a home. Um, and it's, it's part of the church now. Um, and the building has become a home for those people who enjoy it. Um, so I think it's just, it's almost like you have to crash the party. Crash the party then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I would add that a lot of that is also the attachment of certain kinds of morality and concepts of truth and goodness and everything that goes along with something that, oh, you're trying to make something beautiful. And deconstructivism is just trying to get rid of all of that. And so between its brokenness and its jaded perspective and its perversion and everything else, those kinds of ideas are just horrible. It's like the whole time period where it was like, what are you trying to get me to look at in this painting? You know, you shouldn't have a focal point anymore in a yeah. painting or you're like, you're trying to say something, you know? So, I mean, all these things kind of work together against yeah. what you're trying to share and Roger, what God has given us. Yeah, Roger Scruton talks about that in his book on beauty. So mm -hmm. he's, a, he's a philosopher who died around the same time my dad, a conservative English philosopher. <laughs> he was into architecture. And he, he was complaining about acts of aesthetic iconoclasm, where they were tearing down old buildings and desecrating beauty all over the place. And so he started thinking about this, and he said that beauty makes a demand on people mm -hmm. to step away from our narcissism and regard something else for what it is instead of what we can do with it. And he wrote a whole book about it, very interesting stuff. But beauty does. I think sometimes scare people a little bit um, because I think, again, because we have this thing written on our hearts, mm -hmm. God is the author of beauty mm -hmm. and that beautiful things are somehow moral in a sense because they're connected with the Almighty mm -hmm. who does demand some sort of reckoning. Um, so yeah, it's challenging. Yeah. Now, for some reason that doesn't seem to have happened so much with music. You know, mm. but with painting, mm. <clears throat> yeah. um, it, the painters seem to, to be able to get away with more. And so you can do a lot of really broad stroke type stuff in abstract work and it still gets people's interest. But with music, for some reason, I think that kind of thing is not tolerated as much. Would you say that's true? Yeah, I would. Mm -hmm. So it makes a demand on us and so people sometimes try to smash it. Mm -hmm. Amen. Thank you, Charles. Oh. So let's just close in prayer, shall we? God, thank you for this time that we've had this morning. Thank you so much. Thank you for your presence with us. Thank you for your goodness, your truth, and your beauty, and that you are goodness, truth, and beauty that your words are spirit and life, that you are the way, the truth, and the life, so that as we step out in this venture to receive your gesture of friendship and relationship and covenant, Lord, we know that whether we can see where we're going clearly or not, we know that you're with us and that you are leading us, and we pray that you would help us to discern your lead, to discern your voice, to see what it is you want us to see, to hear